I'm Hanish Patel, and this is User Friendly, the show where we explore emerging trends in tech, media, and telecom, and how they impact business, operations, and the world around you. Today, social platforms have an opportunity to lead and accelerate the creator economy by using technology to meet creators' evolving needs, providing personalized experiences at scale across the creator lifecycle and focusing on opportunities to increase creator monetization and loyalty. But how exactly can social platforms ensure this outcome? In this episode, we'll cover how to attract, retain, and support creators as consumer preferences, monetization opportunities, and social media platforms continue to evolve in an increasingly competitive landscape. Joining me to discuss these topics is Thomas Kim, Director of Product Management and Creator Monetization at YouTube, and Dennis Ortiz, Principal at Monitor Deloitte and US Advertising, Publishing, Social Media and Platforms Leader. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Anish. Looking forward to this. This is a topic that's been in the fray for a while, so hot with conversations going on, but I want to really set the scene for our listeners to begin with, especially given the sheer proliferation of creators to the point that just about anyone is a creator in today's world. So to that end, can you give us a high level overview of who is really considered a creator and what the current state is of the creator economy as a whole? Certainly, there was a time where I think the term creator with a capital C didn't exist. You know, fast forward to today, various estimates put people around the world, 50 to 200 million people in the world who consider themselves creators and are either making a living or able to supplement their income by doing creative pursuits. And that ranges across different formats, different platforms. And so, you know, from something that didn't really exist, say, 15, 16 years ago, it's become a global economy contributor in many ways. And to that point around something that didn't exist 15 or so years ago to where we are today, it's clear that it's not just in one area that there are these so many creators. They seem to be across multiple platforms and creators now truly have that sort of multi-platform strategy in terms of how they get out to their base, their community, wider followership. So I'd love to get your perspective on how creators approach a portfolio and execute on said strategies. I think right now is probably one of the best, if not best time to be a creator. There are so many options for creators to find audiences, find monetization. And I think that's partly why there are so many creators out there. And it has really given this rise to the creator economy. But again, depending on the source, if there's 50 to 200 million people who consider them as creators, it's a little hard to generalize how creators approach a portfolio. I think within that space, there's creators who are focused on, say, a content vertical or a format and really leaning into one platform, while others are using many platforms and many formats for different purposes. And so here at YouTube, I think what we want to offer is kind of what's created the creator economy in the first place, which is reach creative freedom and monetization. And that happens because on YouTube, creators can connect with over 2 billion global users and they could do it in whatever format they want. They could do 10 second videos, a five minute song, 10 minute videos, one hour podcast, or even two hour live streams. And that format diversity is what I think eventually we'll see is creators will lean into a lot of different platforms and formats. And I think that is really the future, if not the present already. So keeping with that train in terms of the opportunities that are there and given just the sheer reach, right? Can you talk a little bit more about what platforms have offered in terms of monetization? Because that's key for a good number of creators. A number of them think of it from a monetization opportunity. So what have they offered in that realm for creators? What I think I could speak to is what YouTube offers and the YouTube Partner Program, which is the program that I lead at YouTube. And going back about... 16 years ago, YouTube made an industry changing decision, really, to share advertising revenue with users who were uploading videos at the time. And 16 years later, YPP, or the YouTube Partner Program, really is the backbone of the creator economy. 
In just three years, YPP has paid out $50 billion to creators, media co's, music labels around the world. And so just that vast amount of earnings potential has, I think, really unlocked a lot of the creativity that you see on YouTube and also all around the internet. Because we're at a time now where creators can make a living doing what they love, and they're not necessarily gated by you know, a few people that think that this is what viewers want to see. And I think that's really been kind of what's driven the creator economy. You know, ads is kind of where I think a lot of the creator economy started, but also that's diversified quite a bit. At least for YouTube, we offer now more than 10 ways to earn. And beyond just ads, we have ways through our fan funding products that let viewers directly financially support creators. And as you know, we also have things like YouTube Premium, where users pay to get a more premium experience of YouTube, and we share revenue from that as well. And that's really important. You know, with such diversity of creators and the fact that there's more creators than ever, that means that you need lots of different ways to earn because different creators will benefit more from certain types of monetization. And I think that's what you're seeing is more dollars and more ways to earn. I want to touch upon what you mentioned earlier around original way around advertising. And Dennis, I want to put this one to you, right? How do you think that the platforms can truly, one, attract, but most importantly, also retain these multi-platform creators for more return on investment when it comes to advertising and those advertising partners then? So I think in order to answer that question, it's important to really contextualize the role of creators, right? They create the content that these platforms rely on in order to attract viewers or an audience to the platform, which then in turn drives advertisers towards the platform. So with that, you know, in order to attract and retain, TK had addressed the monetization element, which can come in a variety of forms that can come from payments from the platform directly. It could actually come from followers themselves, but there's also brand partnerships too that a creator could facilitate on their own or the platform could help them facilitate. In addition to monetization, I think the other kind of key piece to attracting and retaining these creators is around helping the creator facilitate engagement with their audience and to develop a community. And then lastly, on top of that, it's providing the right level of support. You know, we've heard overwhelmingly from creators across multiple platforms that the key for them and what drives loyalty for them to a platform is the support the platform gives them in helping them understand the performance of their content on the platform. And that can come through direct engagement with someone from a partnerships team. It could actually also come in self-service analytics to help them understand the engagement of viewers or followers with their content things that will help them succeed on the platform. So it's really a combination of monetization, facilitating engagement with the audience, and then the support that they get to help drive or improve the performance of their content. I really do think that if you think about a creator, after a certain point when you're not doing it casually, you are an entrepreneur and you're taking risk, right? In a field where there aren't necessarily as much business infrastructure set up for these types of entrepreneurs, right? And so I do think it's important that creators feel that a partner shares in their success. And if you think about how YouTube structured our partnership, by having a rev share model, YouTube succeeds when creators succeed. That's kind of the setup because to Dennis's point, there is that virtual circle of good creators drawing audiences, advertisers want to be there, and then creators benefit financially from that. And that lets them sustain their business and hire people, buy equipment, et cetera. And as you folks run businesses, you also know that support is a really important part of running a business. And in some ways, I think we've invested a lot, providing a number of different ways with us, communications, high-touch support. It's because in many ways, these are entrepreneurs that are running businesses and they need support to kind of manage a business. And I think that's at the end of it, what platforms need to do to really treat creators like partners and support their businesses. So going off the back of what the both of you have just said, I want to anchoring on one particular area, YouTube, and within that, shorts, because you've seen such a big proliferation of shorts, and particularly for those mobile first creators. So what value do YouTube and shorts provide for those mobile first creators? You know, it's funny, it's almost kind of full circle, right? So 
when YouTube launched in 2005, the first video was actually an 18 second video. So in some ways, it was actually the first shorts video. And what happened is that as video production costs came down and hosting came down, it allowed longer and longer videos, right, which became kind of what really drove YouTube success. And now with all the progress in mobile technology and creation tools, to me, YouTube Shorts is just the natural progression to empower the next generation of mobile-centric creators. And at the end of the day, creators are looking for reach, audience, monetization, and we share in the collective success. And so I think the real value prop for Shorts is you get the reach of a 2 billion global audience, monetization, and that actually benefits not just the next generation of mobile-first creators, but we also have a number of traditional YouTube creators who are using YouTube Shorts as a way to actually gain new audience and also to diversify their content. It is a lighter format for you to experiment with new ideas. It doesn't have quite the time investment of a long-form video. So I think in some ways it's beneficial to the overall ecosystem as well. So going from an 18-second clip to where we are today, and Dennis, I know you spend a lot of time in the market studying the creators, advising in that space. And there clearly seems to be a lot of focus on kind of building communities, building that connection for those creators. I'll be interested to see what trends you're seeing. Again, if we go back from what started from an 18 second clip to where we are today and where you see it going forward, we'd love to get your perspective on that. So our latest creator economy survey found that 83% of creators Creators agree that their primary platform has a thriving community that they actually enjoy being a part of. And then close to 90% of the creators agree that their primary platform facilitates ways for them to engage with their audience. And, you know, part of their priorities as creators is really to focus on delivering quality content and an experience. 58% of creators agree with that. And then roughly 43% of creators prefer to engage directly with their followers. So those are some of the trends that we're actually seeing in this space around community building and driving connection with audiences. So given those stats that we're seeing across the industry as a whole, TK, can you speak to how YouTube has helped those creators foster that community and build that authenticity as they connect with that community, that followership, and really kind of build that personal brand that you see so many of the creators doing? Yeah, I think given the sheer number of creators out there, we shouldn't lose the fact that that is composed of individuals who come from many different and identify with many different communities. And as far as supporting these communities, this is a deeply, deeply personal motivation for me. And I think for many folks, this will resonate with them. But as an Asian American growing up in the 90s, I mean, there was nobody who looked like me in traditional media. So long before I worked at YouTube, I was just a personal fan of YouTube because it was the first time I could see on video stories and narratives of people who look like me, these stories that really resonated with me. And I think this holds true for many of the viewers who found affinity with the communities that they identify on platforms like YouTube. And that's why many of them chose to become creators. What I think we're especially proud of is that YPP has provided the means for many of these creators from all these communities to earn a living doing what they love and sharing their voice with the world. And I think it's very important that platforms like YouTube reflect the full diversity of global society. I personally actually work on a lot of projects to ensure that our systems are fair. I personally also serve as the executive sponsor of our many Asian American Pacific Islander creator advocacy programs. And, you know, I have colleagues who are doing that for many other communities. And it's really important because, you know, what's lost in the numbers is the fact that this is actually made up of many communities and it's important that they all have a voice. And I love that. Such an important aspect, like you said, of community, but then representation of, right? That's something that's so important and to the core to many of us for 100%. So sticking with that train of what you talked about in terms of just, in this case, what YouTube are providing some of those creators and Dennis, as you talked about in some of those stats that you're seeing about how they're using that primary platform to engage with their audience. A question to the both of you in terms of what can, as well as what they currently do, but what other things come to mind as what platforms can really be providing creators along with the monetization, along with the algorithms to really 
allow those creators to trust a platform and a brand for where they want to put their content out, how they want to engage with their community. What are some of the things that they can be doing? And maybe as a part two of a question, how can the platforms also support the creators from different communities, identities to really improve equity and amplify voices, which is such an important aspect of what we're seeing over the last couple of years as well. Based on some of our conversations with creators across a variety of platforms, I think the number one theme on this specific topic has actually been around transparency. And transparency actually comes in multiple forms. So when we talk to creators, they talk about transparencies around policies, around content, and understanding why content may be taken down from a specific platform, but also transparency around content performance. And this goes back to kind of what TK had discussed around support and even around analytics. They want to better understand how their content is performing. And I think you'll find some variation in the level of insight that creators actually get from these platforms on how their content is performing. So transparency is key. I agree. Thematically, creators are looking for platforms to be their partners. And the way we think about it is we succeed when our creators succeed. And if you're business partners, you have to have constant communication and try to be transparent where you can with your business partners. You know, over the years, we've built multiple channels to communicate with creators. And that ranges from if we make small product feature changes to when we make big policy updates. And that's communicated via our team of partner managers who have one-on-one conversations with our creators. We do notifications in the product, email, social posts, blog posts. We have an entire video program we run called Creator Insider. And the intent there is to try to meet the creators where they're at. Now, I will say that there are times where we can't be as transparent. And it's because oftentimes we're fighting abuse on the platform. And if we were too transparent, that would just give abusers clues to exploit our gaps and our defenses. And one thing we can't do is allow YouTube to lose the trust of our viewers, our advertisers, and frankly, broader society, because that would mean there'd be less audience for creators. There'd be less monetization available for all of the good, responsible creators we have. And so I spent a lot of time trying to strike that balance within even the YouTube Partner Program. We have to make decisions on who we let monetize and who we don't. And I think we don't always get it right, but I think we do a lot of the time. And that's the trade-off we have the balance of being able to have direct transparency, but making sure that we're also defending the platform. If I think about what the two of you have mentioned around that transparency and what you can provide and maybe what creators are looking for and how you create the right platforms, the right environment for people to have success. As the economy continues to evolve, and by economy, I mean the creator economy continues to evolve. What do you see as enduring dynamics that will either stay constant or may actually change and evolve? So there are two key things that come to mind for me. One is that the creator economy will be dominated by a small set of platforms, YouTube, certainly within that set. I think the mass following that these platforms have attracted over time just makes it very difficult for new entrants into this space. You know, a good example of that might actually be with Twitter and Blue Sky kind of coming into the picture. None of those other competitors to that really kind of took off. And then with threads coming into the picture, the number of immediate users that amassed onto that platform just given the carryover from Instagram users. So I think that's number one. Number two, and this is a statement that I'll make that I think we don't talk enough about, is that the creator economy does pose a viable threat to traditional media. And what I mean by that is if you look at the content and where eyeballs are actually going and where people are actually spending time, A lot of that now is being disintermediated and people aren't going to the theaters as much. They're not spending as much time streaming on traditional platforms or movie platforms. They're actually going to platforms like YouTube and watching short form content and spending time there. The other thing I'll add on top of that is if you look how search habits have actually changed, what these platforms are being used for right now is actually 
as search because the content that's being produced is much more robust. And if you put that into perspective, I think creators will continue to be elevated in their role in our day-to-day online content consumption will continue to evolve as a result of their role. Yeah, I completely agree that the eyeballs are certainly shifting. And I think that's been a testament to YouTube's growth. That all being said, I think there's place for both, at least here at YouTube. Many of the traditional media companies have been great content partners for us. I think you all know about the partnership that we've had with NFL. And it's a way for them to engage a new audience as well as a way for us to kind of expand our reach as well. So I think there's room for both. That all being said, in some ways, I think what may be different is that we've had enough generations of creators now that this kind of latest generation of creators, I do feel like are just much more business savvy and really see themselves as a business and brands. The other thing I think I'm seeing, which I think is interesting, is that given the amount, there are a number of, I think, creator-oriented services that are propping up. There are hundreds of startups in this space. I think there will be some rationalization there, obviously. But given the amount of dollars out there, I do think there will be a number of services providers for creators and it'll probably allow them to actually own more of their content and their audience. I think that's definitely a trend because, again, creators are much more savvy, they're businesses, and I think they'll need a lot of business infrastructure for them to own their audience and their monetization as well in the future. As we close, something I'd like to cover that is on many minds of recent, and you're probably both thinking, oh, wow, I was about to go through a meeting or a call without someone mentioning this term, but I'm going to go mention it right now, and that's generative AI. How do you see generative AI starting to impact the creator economy in the near term? And what's the potential for the opportunities or even the risks that you expect generative AI to bring in the longer term? Sure. So this is where social platforms actually have an opportunity to lead and accelerate the creator economy by leveraging technology such as Gen AI. In our latest creator economy survey, we found that 62% of creators actually anticipate that they'll be using Gen AI to shape their business. And the number one expected use case was actually as a creative assistant and leveraging Gen AI to generate content ideas. The number two and number three expected uses of AI really revolved around the workflow production and writing captions. So imagine being able to leverage Gen AI to create drafts, to edit content and videos, et cetera. So that's somewhat of a forecast into how Gen AI will impact creators and the creator economy. But that that being said, there are some potential risks associated with that. You know, one risk certainly is around fact-checking and the content that is generated by Gen AI and depending on the kind of content that you're actually creating is what you're getting from the results actually correct. And then the second thing, I think this goes more broadly around any search type of algorithm is how inclusive are the results? Are you getting a wide array of results that are representative of the various types of individuals that are out there and views, et cetera. Yeah, I think we're all very excited about what AI could do to unlock new forms of creativity. And I do think it'll expand even further who can be a creator. Many of us, I think, are beginning to use some of these Gen AI tools to make our work easier and increase our productivity. And I don't think that's any different. You know, there's a lot of things that creators have to do that isn't necessarily creation itself. Dennis mentioned a lot of those workflows that they do. And so I think they'll free up their time to expand their storytelling. I think you'll see lots of new tools that will help raise their production value without, you know, a lot of physical investments. And I think all of that will mean that there's going to be even more great content out there for all the viewers and users out there. Same time, we do think that there'll be, unfortunately, abusers will use Gen AI tools to their benefit. And so particularly for what I do in YPP, we're staying vigilant to make sure that we maintain the trust that all our users have in YouTube and that we're financially supporting really good, responsible creators. So, you know, YPP is 16 years old right now, so it's a teenager. It's grown a lot. But I think the next couple of years are going to be really, really interesting with the advent of Gen AI and just a sheer amount of creators that are out there. So I think it's a pretty exciting time to be part of the creator economy.
Definitely. I mean, it certainly strikes me just what's happening in the last couple of years to even some of the changes in the last six months to where it's going for Go is thoroughly exciting. And I, I think if I reflect upon the conversation we've had today, it's very clear that the creative economy is evolving quickly and keeping up with the demands of that growth on this overall environment clearly requires the social platforms to provide both the creators and the users a number of needs. And you both talked about how key transparency is, having that visibility into the various programs, the monetization opportunities for the creators. And, and even as you touched upon earlier, some of these are actually becoming big businesses or brands themselves, or one could argue media companies, such as the sheer growth and community size behind that. So a thoroughly exciting space for sure. And with that, TK, Dennis, I really want to thank the both of you for joining me today, sharing your insights on an incredibly interesting topic that just continues to evolve. And to all our listeners, until next time, happy listening. Thanks for listening to User Friendly. To subscribe or listen to more episodes, search for Deloitte User Friendly in your favorite podcatcher or find us online at userfriendly.deloitte.com. If you like what you hear, please rate us on Apple Podcasts and leave a review. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast belong to them and do not necessarily reflect those of Deloitte. This podcast should not be deemed or construed to be for the purposes of soliciting business for any of the companies mentioned nor does Deloitte advocate or endorse the services or products provided by these companies.